Because I think they cannot unmute themselves, but they can write in the chat. Maybe you can say to write in the chat if they can hear. If uh, you can't hear, you can write in the chat. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, someone said they can hear. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, to the PhD designer, myself, and Rika Maneli. She's going to present her work on uh, physics aware operation of power to X and natural gas systems. She was supervised by Associate Professor Jalani Kazakur from DTU Wind and uh, Dr. Tibis Wolf as music. Um, today, uh, she's going to be examined by uh, Associate Professor Chester from DTU Wind, <laughs> Professor Josh um, Taylor from New Jersey Institute of Technology and uh, Advocate Professor Nina Wald from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, so today we'll have three hours. Uh, we will start by a presentation by Enrica for 45 minutes, during which she will not be interrupted. Uh, then we'll have a five minute break, uh, and then we'll proceed with the questions from the examiners. Uh, and if we have time remaining, the supervisors and the audience. Uh, in person and also. Uh, so please do not leave during the presentation or during the questions. So if you want to leave, you have a break uh, of one minute to leave. So we'll have 45 minutes of presentation and then approximately two hours remaining of questions. So now I'm making the slides and I will keep the time and I will let you know how minutes left. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lesia, for the introduction. Can you also hear me, uh, people online? Please write in the chat. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, then I just, uh, I just go. Okay, so thank you everybody for uh, joining today, both online and in person. I will now present the results of my PhD thesis titled Physics Aware Operation of Power to X and Natural Gas Systems. I will. Okay, one second. Okay, now it's working. Okay, so energy systems are transitioning from being based on um, fossil fuels to being based on renewable energies. And most of these renewable energies are weather dependent, meaning that the electricity production uh, is based on the availability, for example, of uh, sun and wind. This introduces high uncertainty and variability in the power system and lead to new operational challenges for power systems. Just to give you an idea of the numbers in the Danish context, there are today around two gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in Denmark. Nine additional gigawatts are, are expected to become operational uh, by 2030. And if we look at a more long-term forecast from the Danish transmission system operator, Energinet, there will be more than 40 gigawatts of offshore uh, wind installed capacity. How to integrate such high amounts of renewable energy in the grid? Well, part of the answer is power to x power to x is uh, related to any process involving transforming renewable uh, electricity into any type of e-fuels and uh, chemicals. And the core uh, element of this transformation is the electrolyzer. Electrolyzers are able to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen can then be further uh, transformed into other e-fuels and chemicals. 
And these are crucial for the indirect electrification and decarbonization of hard to abate sectors, such as industry and heavy transport. Additionally, uh, hydrogen and its derivative can be uh, affordably stored in large quantities, both for short-term and long-term seasonal storage. Finally, electrolyzer can be operated very flexibly to provide frequency regulation to power systems. Again, uh, giving an idea, in, in the Danish context, the Danish government uh, has a plan to build between 4 and 6 gigawatt of installed electrolyzer capacity by 2030, uh, and more than 30 gigawatt by 2050. Power to X is just part of the answer to integrating more and more renewables in the grid. There are also other sources of flexibility, for example, electricity storage, demand response, uh, sector coupling. And this uh, last refers to having a more integrated operation of pl and planning of different energy sectors to harness uh, synergies and complementarities between sectors and energy carriers. For example, with the, the integration between power and its heat sector, uh, transport sector, and with the gas sector. The gas sector has been especially studied in the last year since it can provide flexibility to the power system. And I will discuss later on which type of flexibility I'm talking about. And additional, additionally, um, the gas infrastructure can be crucial for uh, transport of hydrogen in, in the future. In this context, this thesis uh, takes two different perspectives. The first one looks at the coupling between uh, power and hydrogen sectors. These two are coupled by hybrid power plant consisting of renewable energy sources, electrolyzer, and storage technologies. Um, and in this case, we are looking at a stakeholder perspective where we take the perspective of an owner of a hybrid power plant or potential investor in this technology, aiming at optimizing the operation of the plant uh, to maximize his own profit. The second perspective is uh, regarding the integrated operation of power and natural gas sectors. The two are coupled by gas power power plant. And in this case, we'll take a system perspective. We take the perspective of the uh, system, uh, transmission system operator that wants to co-optimize the two systems together to extract flexibility from the gas network. You see here um, a hybrid power plant with co-located wind farm, electrolyzer, and hydrogen storage. Um, this, uh, the owner of the hybrid power plant can decide whether to sell the renewable e electricity to the grid or uh, sell the produced hydrogen to a hydrogen off-taker or potentially in the future, directly injecting it into a pipeline infrastructure. Uh, in this context, we uh, look at uh, how to model the electrolyzer for operational problem of hybrid power plants. Electrolyzer are nonlinear assets and often the, their nonlinear behavior is uh, neglected in the literature. So our first research question is, what is the impact of neglecting an accurate modeling of the electrolyzer physics for operational purposes? Uh, since we find that indeed there are situations where it is important, we, the second research question is how to model this physics uh, in an accurate way, but at the same time ensure uh, computational scalability for larger scale optimization problems. The third research question is related to providing ancillary services uh, to the power system with the electrolyzer and um, estimating how much the profit can be increased by providing also ancillary services. Regarding the system perspective of the thesis, while for power system, we need to ensure instantaneous power balance between supply and demand. This is not the case for, for natural gas networks, where pipeline can be used as a short term uh, storage by charging and discharging the amount of gas present in the pipe. And I will be referring as this as line pipe flexibility. Several studies have uh, addressed the coordinated operation of power and natural gas systems in the literature, showing that by a more coordinated operation, the line pack flexibility can be used to reduce the operating cost of the integrated systems. However, this type of optimization problem requires to include the equation governing the slow gas flow dynamics. This is a set of nonlinear, non-convex partial differential equation that I will be showing later. 
So the research question here is, is it possible that by introducing approximation or relaxation for the gas flow equations, we are actually overestimating the line pump flexibility? Part of the uh, contribution of this uh, thesis were also included in a project in collaboration with the industry aiming at developing sustainable business model for, for power to X technologies. The uh, four research questions are addressed into uh, four publications. Three of them are related to the stakeholder perspective of the thesis uh, and have been already uh, published, while the last research question is addressed in a, a paper that is currently under review. This is how um, the presentation, the outline for today's presentation look like. We have just finished the, the introduction. I will just, I will then move to uh, presenting the uh, contribution and results related to the stakeholder perspective, uh, then to the system perspective. And finally, I will provide some conclusions and future research directions. Okay, um, starting with the stakeholder perspective, as I mentioned before, there are, uh, the first two research questions are related more to modeling the physics of the electrolyzer, while the third one is related to uh, enhancing the electrolyzer prof profitability with ancillary service provision. And due to time limitation in this presentation, I will focus answering the first two research questions. And um, I will just present briefly one slide about the third research question, but more details are available in the thesis and in the paper. Okay, you see here the hybrid power plant scheduling problem. Uh, We're taking the perspective of the owner of the plant that want to optimize the operation to maximize uh, its, his own profit. The profit is the difference between revenues from selling power to the grid at the day ahead the power price and selling hydrogen to a hydrogen demand at a fixed hydrogen price. And the costs are related to all the uh, operational costs of the plant, for example, the cost of starting up the electrolyzer in a certain hour. Uh, these are all the hybrid power plant constraints, including, for example, the power balance equation at this node, or if there are some uh, limits, maximum and minimum demand requirement we have to satisfy uh, with our off-taker. The last constraint uh, is the one representing the electrolyzer conversion physics, which I will be referring as the hydrogen production. So the relationship between input power in the electrolyzer and the output hydrogen production. This is the only uh, nonlinear and non-convex constraint in, in this uh, optimization problem. So we'll focus in the next slides on how to uh, approximate and relax this constraint to, to include it in the problem. Um, so you see here the efficiency curve for an electrolyzer. On the x-axis, you have the electrolyzer power consumption expressed as a percentage of the full load capacity. And on the y-axis, the efficiency expressed in kilograms of out output hydrogen per input of megawatt hour electricity. And you see there is a peak around 30% of the load. For higher power consumptions, the, the efficiency decreases. Uh, almost linearly, and for um, low power consumption, the efficiency drops quite rapidly due to increasing losses in the electrolyzer. We can use the efficiency curve to build the hydrogen production curve, which is just the power consumption versus the hydrogen production. And since the efficiency is uh, it's not constant over the operating range of the electrolyzer, the hydrogen production is not linear, but it has more a quadratic uh, shape. So as of our main contribution, we propose three different modeling approaches for, for the electrolyzer. Uh, I will go into the detail of each of them in the next slides, but I want to mention that, again, what goes into the optimization problem is the hydrogen production curve, not the efficiency curves, but I will still be showing the efficiency curve because I find them sometimes more intuitive to understand the uh, type of approximation and relaxation introduced. And the black curve ex represent the experimental uh, nonlinear uh, hydrogen production curve, dash blue are approximations and blue shaded area are uh, relaxations. Let's start with the first one, the mixed integer linear model. 
This is based on a piecewise linear approximation of the hydrogen production curve by dividing the operating range into uh, segments. And uh, of course, the more segments we use, we use the better we are capturing this nonlinear uh, behavior in the uh, electrolyzer. However, this comes at the cost of adding one binary variable per second. So uh, an extension of, of this is to instead uh, use a relaxation of the piecewise linear curve so that we don't ask to be on the dashed blue line, but we admit also points in this uh, blue shaded area. The advantage is that we don't need binary variables uh, in this case, but we still need to select the position and number of linearization points to reach the desired accuracy. The third model is a conic model where we first fit a second order polynomial to the uh, black curve, to the experimental hydrogen production curve. So the second order polynomial is this blue dashed line. This is still a non-convex constraint, is a quadratic equality constraint. So we propose instead to relax this constraint um, so that this can be reformulated into a second order constraint. Again, uh, we don't need to include binary variables in this formulation, and we also don't need to define linearization points and number of segments. Just to summarize, this was the hybrid power plant scheduling problem that I showed before with the hydrogen production curve in yellow, and we have proposed three different uh, approaches for uh, including the nonlinear behavior of the electrolyzer into the uh, scheduling problem. Let's move now to results, starting with the first uh, research question, where we are looking at the impact of a more or less accurate representation of the electrolyzer physics into our scheduling problem. And to do that, I will be using the mixed integer model uh, with increasing number of segments, so that by selecting a smaller or bigger amount of segments, we can tune the accuracy of the model. You see here the optimal power consumption of the electrolyzer for um, three different uh, models, one with one segment, four segments, and 12 segments. And just to mention, the one with one segment is just a linear approximation of the hydrogen production curve, so we don't need any, any binary variable. And this is for one representative day. So you see in red the day ahead power prices, and these are the same for the three uh, plots. What is different is the optimal uh, schedule of the electrolyzer based on the level of accuracy of, of the model. And you see there are certain hours during the day, for example, in these first hours of the day, where they all take the same dispatch decision, so working at full power. But there are also hours where Depending on the level of detail of the electrolyzer, the, um, the different models take different dispatch decisions. And if you look at the one with 12 segment, you see that the more segment we add, the more the electrolyzer is consuming power dynamically following the, the day ahead price signal. And this happened in a specific price range. Um, you see here a histogram of the day ahead uh, uh, power prices in Easter Denmark for 2019. So there are um, this uh, this region here where with, with relatively low they had power prices in that case is uh, always profitable to produce hydrogen than selling electricity to the grid. So no matter how many segments we choose, we will always choose to operate the electrolyzer at full load production. If we look at the other side of the plot, these are um, hours with relatively high power price. Uh, where no matter uh, the detail of the electrolyzer, uh, we will always choose to not produce any hydrogen and instead sell the electricity to the grid. Then there is a intermediate range of, uh, of power prices. And this is the, the green region where depending on the uh, level of accuracy of the electrolyzer model, uh, we will obtain different dispatch decisions. And we can calculate this uh, upper and lower bound of this green uh, region analytically. Uh, they are uh, depending only on the electrolyzer efficiency curve. So all the parameters in purple are related to the shape of the efficiency curve. For example, the efficiency at full load, the efficiency at the peak. 
Um, in yellow, it's the standby power consumption of the electrolyzer. So all the yellow and purple parameters are somehow related to the type of electrolyzer you have in your plant or if you're planning to, to buy. And the third is uh, the hydrogen price in um, uh, orange here. And both the upper and lower bound are proportional to the hydrogen price. So that if we agree with off-taker a higher hydrogen price, this, this green area here, will be uh, shipped towards higher power prices. And this uh, upper and lower bound can be used as an a priori check for the need of an accurate model. So for example, um, if uh, we know the type of electrolyzer, we know um, the hydrogen price we have agreed with the off taker, uh, we can uh, check if this uh, green region overlap with the expected range of uh, power prices or, or not. I show you before the different dispatch de decision taken by model with different segments uh, for one representative day. What happens if for the whole year we operate our electrolyzer with a more or a less detailed model? What is the impact of on the yearly profit and on the contribution to revenues from selling hydrogen and selling electricity? So you see if you compare the case with one segment and 12 segment, um, neglecting the nonlinear behavior to, of the electrolyzer uh, leads to a profit underestimation of around 1%, but a considerably uh, higher uh, change in the hydrogen production. So if we neglect this peak in the efficiency curve, what happens is there are many hours during the year where it would be profitable to produce hydrogen, but since we are not capturing the peak in the efficiency curve, we are actually preferring uh, to sell power to the grid instead of producing hydrogen. So now that we have seen that there are indeed cases where it matters to have a more detailed model, I will move to the second research question that is how to include the um, this electrolyzer details into a more uh, computational uh, scalable manner. Because as we said, the mixed integer linear model requires to use uh, binary variables for, um, for each segment. So uh, I will now discuss the exactness of the relaxation of the other two uh, models we propose. And to do that, I will use the conic model, but identical observation uh, applied to the linear model. You see here the uh, conic um, hydrogen production curve. Uh, if this constraint here is uh, binding at optimum, so we find, for example, a solution in point H2, it means that our relaxation is exact, but we may also find a solution where this constraint is non-binding, for example, in H3. Uh, in this case, we, we say the relaxation is inexact. And the difference between the two is the relaxation gap. And an intuitive interpretation of this is that there is some hydrogen that is being wasted. Or another intuitive representation is that we are consuming an excessively high amount of power. So we could produce the same amount of hydrogen uh, in point H4, but we decide to instead consume more power to produce the same amount of hydrogen. And um, in, the, in the paper, we uh, provide the condition for the exactness and the inexactness of this relaxation. And we see, for example, uh, under the assumption of a, a positive uh, hydrogen prices. And we see, for example, that um, if we have, um, for example, let's imagine that we have a um, hydrogen truck coming every day to pick up the hydrogen. So this is represented by this maximum total hydrogen production constraint. And if this constraint is non-binding, then the relaxation will always be exact. The, the second theorem is saying that if this uh, maximum total hydrogen production constraint is binding at optimum, so let's say that our truck is, is full, um, but the power prices are positive, still uh, we have uh, exactness of the relaxation. The only case where uh, the relaxation is inexact is the case with the maximum total hydrogen production constraint binding over the subset of hours with negative prices. And we tested this on a real, um, they had power prices 
uh, for 2019. And we could see that this is a quite strict uh, requirement. Uh, there were only two days over the whole year where the relaxation was, was inexact. So we concluded that the relaxations are exact under prevalent operating conditions. And the mathematical proofs are, are available in the thesis. Now that we have seen that the relaxations are exact in most operating conditions, we can compare the solution of the three different uh, models. Um, for the same number of segments, the mixed integer linear and the linear model uh, achieve exactly the same solution if the relaxation is exact. If we compare the conic model with the other two, we need, in our case study, around 10 segments to achieve a similar level of accuracy between the conic model and, and the other two. So moving to um, assessing the computational performances of, of the three methods, uh, and to do that, we use a stochastic model where we increase the number of scenarios to test how the computational performances uh, scale with the number of scenarios, with the size of the problem. So first, uh, let's compare the mixed integer and uh, linear mixed integer linear and linear model. These two, as as we said, for the same number of segments, have exactly the same solution, and we see that the linear model is around eighty percent faster than the mixed integer with the same solution. Um, if we look at the comparison between the conic model and the linear model, if we look at the, for example, a hundred number of scenarios. So a quite bigger uh, scale problem. The conic model is around three times faster than the linear model with 10 segments, so with similar accuracy. And it's actually even faster than the linear model with, with two segments. So we conclude that uh, for a larger scale optimization problem, the conic model achieves a good trade-off between computational performances and uh, accuracy of, of the solution. Um, just one brief slide about the research question trees related to increasing the electrolyzer profit with ancillary services. You see here the revenues and profit for a 10 megawatt electrolyzer located in Eastern Denmark for uh, power and ancillary service prices in 2022. On the left are the revenues with, with ancillary services and on the right without ancillary services. And the profit is the, the black line. So if we look, for example, even in a case with quite high hydrogen price, 11 euros per kilo, kilo kilogram, um, still we achieve a plus 80% increase in the profit compared to the case without ancillary services. Okay, so um, now let's move to the system perspective of, of the thesis. And uh, as I said before, we are now looking at the co-optimization of power and gas systems, uh, especially focusing on the impact of modeling and solution choices on the line pack flexibility estimation. You see here the optimal power gas flow problem. Um, we are, uh, so where I have color in blue, all the power system variables and in red, all the gas system variables. We want to minimize this total uh, system operating cost as the sum of the power and gas costs. This is subject to all the power and gas system constraints, for example, limit in the generator or in the gas supply. The power balance equation at each node of the power system the power flow in lines, which we could model with AC or DC uh, flow approximation. Uh, the gas balance equation, which also functions as a coupling constraint between power and gas, since um, gas fire power plants are uh, demand for the gas sector. And finally, the gas flow in, in pipelines. These two sets of constraints are generally uh, nonlinear and non-convex, and in the next slides, I will focus on how to model the uh, gas flow in the pipelines. So the, the gas flow in pipelines is governed by a set of partial differential equations in, in time and space, where space represents the axis of the pipe. And the variables are the pressure, which I denote with the Greek letter pi. So the pressure along the pipe and the mass flow along the pipe. 
So if we are looking, for example, at one differential volume of gas, this uh, the first equation is the conservation of mass, saying that stating that the net mass outflow is equal to the change in the line pack. So if we have uh, outflow that is bigger than the inflow, we are discharging the pipe and the line pack is decreasing and vice versa, the line pack will be increasing. And the second um, equation is the conservation of momentum, stating basically a uh, equilibrium of all the forces applied to this, uh, in this differential volume of gas. So to incorporate this um, nonlinear non-convex partial differential equations into the power gas flow problem, we uh, have to uh, adopt some modeling and solution choices. The first modeling choice is related to uh, the discretization of the partial differential equation into in time uh, and space. To do that, we apply uh, finite different methods to approximate uh, the partial derivatives in, in time and space. And so we are not looking at a differential volume of gas, but a discrete uh, pipeline of length uh, delta x with a certain uh, pressure at the start node, a certain pressure at the end node, a certain uh, mass inflow and outflow. And we make the assumption that the average um, pressure is uh, the average between the inflow and, and outflow, and the same for the uh, mass flow. And you see that there is no line pack variable in, in this uh, problem, but the line pack can be um, calculated ex post as it is proportional to the average uh, pressure in the pipe. The second modeling uh, choice is related to the type of PDE model that we use in our optimization we could decide to use the full uh, set of uh, discretized PDEs, which I will be referring to as the dynamic model, or we can neglect the inertia term, as this is uh, negligible compared to the uh, friction factor, this other term here. And additionally, we can also uh, neglect line pack change. In this case, we have a steady state model, which is, however, uh, unable to capture the line pack flexibility. Uh, and to discuss the solution choices, I will use now the, the full dynamic model, but the same apply to, to the other two models. So you see that uh, the only nonlinear non-convex term is in the conservation of momentum, and it's this term here. We can introduce an, ex an auxiliary variable, gamma, so that the concert, all these other constraints are, are linear. The only nonlinear non convex constraint is, is this one here. And the absolute value is needed to model the direction in the pipelines. And I will only focus on this uh, gamma term to discuss the uh, different solution choices. So the, the first option is to uh, directly solve the uh, nonlinear non non-convex problem with an exact solution method, uh, which however achieves uh, potentially a locally optimal solution. The other option is to um, use relaxation-based approaches. So we can, for example, directly solve the nonlinear problem using interim point solvers. And you see here on the right, the gamma term as a function of the mass flow. And just to show everything in two dimension, I have assumed a fixed uh, average pressure in the pipe. The second option is to uh, use a successive linear programming approach where we basically solve a series of uh, linear problem obtained by uh, Taylor series expansion uh, around the solution from the previous iteration. Uh, moving to the relaxation-based approaches, um, one option is to, um, to uh, reformulate this into a second-order cone constraint. So we have a mixed integer uh, conic relaxation where, uh, however, we need binary variables to, to separate the physical region into positive and negative flow direction. And we also uh, have uh, added a linear overestimator, this one here, that significantly reduces the, the physical air, uh, region. So all this dotted area is, um, is removed from the physical region. 
Similarly, we can uh, use a mixed integer outer linear relaxation where uh, it's achieved by outer approximation uh, using Taylor expansion around uh, some um, linearization points. And also we have added the linear overestimator to reduce the physical region. The last option is to use a polyhedral envelope method where we also define um, Taylor series ex expansion uh, around certain points. The advantage of this method is that we don't need to use binary variables for, for the flow direction. So the, the main contribution of this thesis are related, for, first of all, to um, building a harmonized framework all, where all modeling and solution approaches are compatible with each other. And uh, this uh, allows for a more rigorous comparison between uh, modeling and solution choices, specifically related to the impact of line path flexibility. This uh, framework also allows for mixed integer conic relaxation for the dynamic model. And um, we've also suggested the use of a linear overestimator for the mixed integer conic and mixed integer outer linear problems to significantly reduce the feasible region. And uh, also as main contribution, we focus specifically on the line pack estimation. Okay, so before um, moving to the results, when comparing the different um, relaxation-based model, we have to, first of all, check the uh, relaxation gap. This is the difference between the left and the uh, right-hand side of this equation here, normalized by the maximum value of, uh, of gamma. So for example, this one here, if we are in the positive direction of the flow, or this one, if the flow is in the negative direction. Uh, and in the results, I will use the these two parameters so the maximum absolute relaxation gap over the all um, time steps and pipelines in the network. And also similarly, I will use uh, root mean square relaxation gap across all time steps and, and pipelines. And to discuss results, I will use a simple case study, which is a three bus power system connected to a four node gas system. The two are connected by generator G2, which is a gas fire power plant, and it's the expensive generator. So it is used to counterbalance the fluctuations in the wind generator, which is uh, W1. So for example, you see that the wind profile is decreasing uh, in, in the morning. So uh, we imagine that this gas uh, fire power plant will have to start up to meet the electricity load. And um, the, the peak both in the gas and electricity load are around hour 10. So we expect the, the system to be uh, congested in, in this part of the day. And I will show the impact on line pack flexibility, first of all, of an exact versus a relaxation-based solution method, then uh, of uh, choosing a smaller or bigger time discretization. And finally, I will compare all different uh, solution choices. And I will show all the results for the dynamic model, even if in the thesis, we also present results for, for the other two, the quasi-dynamic and the steady state model. Um, in the paper, we also look at a bigger scale system, uh, but I will focus in this presentation only on the small case study. Okay, let's start with the uh, results for exact versus relaxation-based uh, solution method. And uh, I have reported here the system where I highlight in green pipeline P2, because I will be showing how the line pack changes in this specific pipe. Mm, the uh, red continuous line is the line pack change for the exact solution method and you see the line pack is charged at the beginning of the day, and then is discharged uh, when the, the peak in the, both the electricity and gas load uh, is. You see that the line pack is discharged, but there is some low shedding represented by this bar, red bar here, as 
uh, the, the gas system is congested, so we're not able to transfer enough gas to the gas fire generator, and there is some load shedding in the power system. If you look instead at the relaxation uh, base model, the continuous line is the line pack change, and you see that uh, we are uh, we're, we don't have any load shedding, and this is because we are able to discharge the line pack at a very high rate between our nine and, and, and 10. Ooh. Okay. So if we, um, if we look, however, at the relaxation gap in, in this hour at hour nine, which is the dashed line, the relaxation gap is uh, around uh, 30%, 25, 30%, which means that we are actually uh, discharging the pipe at a higher but unphysically, phys unphys unphysible rate. Um, so we are actually overestimating the line pack flexibility due to this uh, relaxation gap. If uh, now we look at using a bigger or a smaller time discretization, so it's the same plot, but for a 15 minute time discretization, and uh, you see that the curtailment is uh, increased for the exact solution method, and also there is some curtailment for uh, the relaxation base model, which means that by using a uh, a uh, bigger time discretization, we are actually also overestimating the line pack flexibility. I will now move to comparing the different solution methods uh, together. The first two lines of this table are the two exact methods, so the NLP and the SLP. And then we have all the relaxation-based model that are, um, so in this direction, the, the feasible reason, region is, is increasing. Mm, I show the relaxation gap, the cost, the cost is expressed in relation to the NLP solution and the computational time. So if we first look at the exact solution methods, they, uh, of course, there is no relaxation gap um, and they achieve basically the same, the same solution. And the SLP um, is considerably slower than the NLP, but we have actually seen that for uh, bigger systems, uh, the SLP uh, scales better uh, than, the, than the NLP. Um, if we now look at the relaxation-based model, uh, we see quite high relaxation gap in all the different relaxation-based approaches. So we see up to 65% uh, relaxation gap for the MILP without linear overestimator. And uh, we achieve quite high relaxation gap and also the solution time is, is very high. The solution time is uh, improved by adding the linear overestimator. So the linear overestimator both improves in terms of relaxation gap, but also computational time. But still the solution time is, is very high considering we are looking at a very small system. The, uh, the polyhedral envelope method is uh, um, solved very fast. This is a linear problem, and it achieves uh, not much higher relaxation gaps. Um, but uh, but yeah, still the relaxation gaps are considerably high for all relaxation-based methods. Okay, so moving to the uh, conclusion uh, of this uh, presentation. I will start um, with the stakeholder perspective. We have seen that an accurate modeling of the electrolyzer physics matter, and we could show in which uh, condition uh, it, it is important to have a more accurate model. We can do this by checking a priori this upper and lower bound and see if they overlap with the range of day ahead electricity prices in our specific case study. If we are in a case where it matters to have a more detailed model uh, and we still decide to uh, neglect the inaccurate electrolyzer model. Uh, we end up significantly reducing the hydrogen production uh, in favor instead of selling more power to the grid. Uh, if we look at the relaxation based models, both the linear and conic models, they um, achieve improved computational performances compared to the mixed integer model by avoiding the use of binary variables 
And also we were able to prove mathematically that they are exact under prevalent operating conditions. The um, conic relaxation has the advantage that we don't need to choose linearization points. And also it shows uh, a bit better uh, computational performances for, especially for large scale. And I presented quickly one slide about ancillary service. We have seen that they can significantly improve the electrolyzer profitability. So the main message from, from this uh, part of the research is that uh, we have uh, an a priori check we can use to check before solving the optimization problem, whether we need or not a more accurate uh, representation of the electrolyzer physics. Moving to the system perspective, we have seen that by choosing a coarse time discretization for the partial differential equations, for example, one hour, we can actually overestimate the line path flexibility. And similarly, if we use relaxation-based model, that also can lead to an overestimation of the line path flexibility by exploiting non-zero uh, relaxation gaps. We have seen uh, that the linear overestimator reduces both the relaxation gaps and also improves computational time. Uh, however, the relaxation gap are considerably high in all the relaxation-based models we have looked into. So exact solution techniques should be preferred for, for operational decisions. The uh, objective value of the, for example, the polyhedral envelope method, which is solved very fast, can be used as a lower bound to know how far the solution obtained by the NLP or the SLP, how far is it from global uh, optimality. So the main message is to be aware that there is possibility of overestimation of line pack flexibility due to the modeling and solution choices that we take for the gas flow equations and to check for your specific case if it's relevant maybe to have a 15 minutes time discretization instead of an hour and using an exact solution method instead of a relaxation based one. So uh, future direction for the stakeholder perspective, we have focused on the nonlinear and non-convex behavior of the electrolyzer, but there are other nonlinear and non-convex uh, components for in power to x uh, plants, for example, the um, e-fuel synthesis plants um, also, we were able to prove mathematically the exactness of the relaxations for a simple setup, but more uh, research should address on the exactness of this relaxation for more complex uh, hybrid power plant setups. And uh, um, another interesting research direction is related to the future development of hydrogen markets and ancillary service markets, as they may, these may impact the uh, business model and optimal operational strategies. Regarding the system perspective, we have used a linear model for the compressor in, in our research. Um, further uh, research to address on how to model the uh, nonlinear and non-convex behavior of uh, gas compressors and how to include uh, such uh, behavior into the, the optimization problem in a tractable way. Um, Another interesting research direction is related to prices, pricing line path flexibility. So how to financially compensate for the agents that are contributing to the line pack, uh, which may incentivize the efficient utilization of this type of flexibility. Finally, uh, our research focused on a full coordination method between power and gas systems. So we look at a full co-optimization between power and gas system, which can be used as an ideal benchmark of how much flexibility can be extracted. But this is very uh, different from current market me mechanisms. So further research should address on how much flexibility can be extracted in a more um, like softer coordination mechanism where some type of, some kind of separation between the two sectors is, uh, is kept. You see here, um, main references for this work. More references are available in the thesis. And with this, I conclude. Thanks for the attention.